Welcome back, honors. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of that thing we've been talking about that's been chugging along. <laughs> Get it? Uh, the Industrial Revolution. Now, the big thing about it, though, is, is we left off in class talking about now the expansion of the Industrial Revolution, right? We talked a lot of different things in class about, like, mechanization, the steam engine, its effects, urbanization, communication, transportation, and how a lot of things in Europe, well, particularly Great Britain to start, but in Europe are going to continually change and really manifest themselves in some really, really new and intrinsic and li like really, really big different ways, right? So the big thing about it, though, is let's go ahead and keep picking up right where we left off. Well, the thing we were asking ourselves was how long do you think it's going to take the Industrial Revolution to spread into the continent, right? Now, when we say spread into the continent, we're talking about the actual mainland area of the continent, right? Talking about France, areas like Germany, going all the way over into our Eastern Europe, right? So the thing about it, though, is, is it actually didn't happen until quite a little bit later. Uh, the 1800s is right around when the Industrial Revolution begins to solidify itself as a massive urbanization movement, the growth of factories all over cities, and really kind of separating ourselves from that cottage industry aspect of the, of the Industrial Revolution when it actually looked like spinning Jenny, the flying shuttle, things like that, right? Now things are becoming much more efficient, much more mechanized, much more intense, if you will, right? But the thing about it is that it's going to continue to grow. And if you look at that like kind of like key year, 1800 is right when Napoleon has just come to power in France, right? In 1799, he overthrows the French government with his coup d'etat. And then what ends up going down is he basically comes to power and then becomes emperor of France eventually right so looking at the entire storyline there's no way that the like actual industrial revolution gets spread to the continent immediately because of all of that political tumult right so that is one of the two big reasons right one of the two big reasons is everything that was going on on the continent right you've got the french revolution the rise of napoleon the napoleonic wars that don't even really get cleaned up until like 1820 is kind of actually preventing the growth of factories the growth of urbanization and the movement of goods from britain to the continent in the sense of these developments these discoveries these inventions right now another big reason the second is biggest reason why is because britain deliberately kept it a Secret, right? They literally deliberately kept it under wraps and they were like told some of their citizens that if you sell industrial secrets that the British inventors or that Britain has actually invented to people from the other end of the continent, you could be arrested, right? So like they literally kept it a secret on purpose, right? So now by the 1850s though, you know, it's already spreading because it's not going to stay under wraps, right? You have to understand that like the French, the Germans, the Dutch, the Spanish, all those people are going to immediately start being like, well, where are all these goods coming from? How are they making these cheap textiles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually word is going to spread. And it did, right? It 100% spread to the continent, okay? So the thing is, by the 1850s, the British are like, ah, they're going to find out eventually, so we might as well just show off, right? And so Britain kind of starts showing off a little bit. And they actually even built a massive expo center dedicated to the entire idea of showing off the Industrial Revolution. It was literally called the Crystal Palace, right? The Crystal Palace was this massive building, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of square feet in size. And it was basically a big, like, showcase center, right? It was like the convention center in New Orleans, basically. But this one was built completely out of glass and iron. It had wooden floors, which actually led to it being burned down later on. It's actually not there anymore because it did catch fire in the late 1800s and actually burned down. But interestingly enough, this is what the inside view would have would have looked like but people came from all over Europe to look at all the new things that Britain was developing the things they were making and creating and the things that were coming out of the industrial revolution there right and so the thing about it is though is like I said it did catch on fire due to these uh, wooden floors right here but mostly due to the fact that they think that actually uh, an office fire started that like somebody actually put a like put, tried to put something that was on fire in a trash can it burst into flame eventually and then the entire thing went up right well the thing also though if any of you are soccer fans, right, the e, there's an EPL team called the Crystal Palace, right, and it's actually named and dedicated after that entire structure. So the thing about it, though, going into it, one of the biggest changes that's going to now sweep through Europe is going to be actually focusing on the life of a worker during this time period. Now, we could talk about the life of the middle class if we felt like it, but it would just be them trying to emulate the richer people, right? The life of the worker is the thing that really truly defines the actual industrial revolution itself and their experience is the thing that has echoed throughout history okay because their experience was so bad that literally governments are going to start getting involved with reform movements the creation of welfare states and many other things like that right so going into it first of all we have to understand <clears throat> that there are two places 
that you could end up working if you were a worker during the Industrial Revolution. You could end up working in a factory, right? So, like, of course, right? The factories are, you know, like a factory. It is what it is, right? So the factories, though, that have now been moved into the cities that are now being powered by steam, and they now actually have automatic looming devices and things like that, they were not fun to work in. You could work anywhere from 12 to 16 hour shifts, uh, the machines had no safety mechanisms on them. The factories also had little to no ventilation whatsoever. And workers who got sick typically got fired, right? So the thing about this you have to understand by all these different ideas is like safety mechanisms, for example, are mechanisms on the machine that deliberately turn it off if something goes wrong, right? For example, you have one um, in your washing machine, right? Like in your, in your clothes wash machine, if you lift the lid on it and stuff like that, it will stop spinning. That is a safety mechanism, right? My brother and I one time threw a bunch of frozen fruit in there when it was spinning and it was wild because we figured out that if you just push this little button down, uh, like it actually would like, you know, keep spinning. It was pretty nuts. The frozen grapes were crazy. Now, like the big thing about it, though, when we're looking at it is, uh, we got in a lot of trouble for that. The big thing about it, though, when we're looking at it is you also have to understand that these safety mechanisms are going to be a very, very dangerous byproduct because if you also got injured on the job, you could easily get fired as well. Child labor also, though, is very, very important when you're talking about the growth of factories because they were actually some of the earliest factory workers because they actually went to these places called foundling hospitals and orphanages to actually find people to work in the factories up front. And as you can see right here, a foreman is actually striking this child right there for actually messing up something on that power loom and the thread or the bobbin on the threads, right? So the thing about it though, when you're looking at it, is child labor is going to grow due to the fact that early, early workers that could have entered into the factories actually really didn't want to go. They really, really didn't want to go at all. They actually referred to the factories, these things called like satanic mills, and they thought they looked a lot like poorhouses, so they avoided them as often as possible. But eventually, families and other people are going to start entering into the factories because it's the only line of work that they can really find. The other thing that is also going to pop under this is the gender division of labor. If we zoom in right here, you can see that all the people that are operating these power loom machines are actually women, right? Women were typically trusted to actually operate machinery. Uh, they got paid less than men, while men did much more of the labor that actually involved shoveling coal into the steam engines that powered the factories or actually doing a lot of very, very large scale manual labor, right? So now speaking of manual labor, the other area that you could end up working in the Industrial Revolution that is the, the mines, right? Because the Industrial Revolution itself is going to create a much higher demand for iron and coal, right? So since then, we need even more iron and coal because we need even more of those ingots and those piglets and those little things and stuff like that, you have to understand that you're going to have to dig more mines to actually satisfy the demand for the construction of factory machines, for the construction of factories themselves, because the many of them are iron reinforced, right? And coal is going to be necessary for the blast furnaces as well as the bigger blast furnaces that are coming along that will eventually make steel. Now, miners, though, were paid more but conditions were even worse than in the factories, right? You're working underground, you're working under in practical darkness. Cave-ins are a very, very serious danger. Being buried alive is a serious danger. There's like next to no ventilation down there. And also an interesting fact as well is that early on in mines, many whole families would actually enter into the mines together, right? A mother and her children might actually enter into the mines together to work as one collective unit. Now, middle-class reformers are going to later on pass laws saying that women can't work underground anymore and that uh, boys under the age of 10 cannot work underground anymore. But a lot of that has to do just with the fact that it was like a bunch of middle-class, like, huffity puff and stuff like that. Now, look, getting into it, though, also, there's a disease that you could very, very easily get while working in the mines as well. And it's actually when coal dust would actually begin to cake onto the person's lung tissue it's called black lung disease, right? Okay, black lung disease is something that could actually cause a serious form of cancer, and it actually can lead to death at a very, very young age, right? So coal dust doing that to you is also while you're trying to work, while you're trying to haul carts that weigh over 500 pounds full of raw iron and coal, it's just not a very, very fun experience, right? Now, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, whole families worked in the mines, but by the 1800s, it was just men. There was actually this thing that came out called the Mines Act of 1833, uh, so that actually like prevent, or no, that was the Factories Act of 1833. The Mines Act of 1844 is the one that's going to come out and it's actually going to prevent um, women from working underground anymore. So going into it though as well, child labor, let's zoom in on that, right? Because we've got a lot of kids working here, right? Talking about the factories, we saw that picture of the foreman striking that kid and stuff like that. Now originally, children were your very, very first workers, right? They were your very first factory workers, all right, because they were actually coming from orphanages and stuff like that. So the thing about it was, like I said earlier, like 
people didn't want to go work in these factories at first, so the factory owners had to find someone to work in them, so they actually turned kids, right? Now, these right here are two children, like two little boys actually working on a power loom, a threading machine that actually has all the bobbins and the thread on top of it, and they're reloading them as they run out. And these young boys right here are actually like workers from a coal mine, right? Now, going into it, though, as well, as the revolution advances, families and children begin to work together, right? So the thing about it, though, in the sense of a mom or a dad would go up to the factory owner or the mine work or owner or something like that and negotiate with them about how much they want to get paid for the entire family's labor, right? Now, children, though, had some of the most dangerous jobs, right? This actually includes for the fact that, one, you could start working as early as five, right? Now, in a factory, for example, if you were a five-year-old and you were there working with your mom or something like that, you would be running around picking up, like, scraps of cloth from under the machines and stuff like that, right? Which is still intrinsically dangerous because you're walking or crawling underneath a very large power loom that at any moment... If it breaks or falls or comes down, it's going to crush that child, right? Working in the mines, though, you could end up hauling carts, right? Opening air vents and things like that. But the most popularized story, the most famous story of child, child children working during the Industrial Revolution has to do with repairing factory machines, right? Now, a lot of people, whenever they imagine this, they imagine this like being like, oh, did they give this little kid a wrench and he climbed inside this machine and was just like tinkering away? No, what actually would happen is when we say repairing them, the biggest machines that were being used during the Industrial Revolution were power looms, right? So these big power looms right here that were used to actually make textiles are every now and again going to have threads on them that get tangled, right? The threads will get tangled up and stuff like that, and children with their very small hands would actually reach inside the machine itself to actually try and untangle it. Now, the dangerous part is, is if it actually turns back on and there's no safety mechanism on this machine, it can grab the kid's hand break their fingers, and possibly rip skin down to the bone off of their hands and things like that. So as you can tell, it's a very, very dangerous set of work, and especially for kids, right? Now, so in the long run, when you're looking at it, you got to kind of ask yourself, Industrial Revolution, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, like, like, so when you think about it, like the progression of society has gone to a really far point. Like I'm keeping time with this flip right now on my phone that's a smartphone and stuff like that, which is a product of the Industrial Revolution. I am now actually speaking into a computer and recording my lessons because this is a product of the Industrial Revolution had the inventions not come before that during the 1800s, we never would have cycled up until what we're going to now. You could also make the argument that the Industrial Revolution never stopped, right? That it just kept rolling forward and that it continues to roll forward. But the question is, is are we better off as a society when we're looking at history and in historiography after this entire movement slash during it, right? Well, the thing about it is there were a lot of positives to the Industrial Revolution, right? Industrial Revolution positives include there were more jobs, right? More jobs, more job availability meant that people had more consistent employment and could actually avoid starvation level poverty and things like that much, much easier and simpler, right? Now, wages are also going to continue to rise. For the early part of the Industrial Revolution, many workers will actually see high wage earning power as they actually enter into the earliest factories operating these new power looms and things like that. Now, unfortunately, wages will eventually stagnate, and I'm going to get to that here in about two seconds. But rising wages does encourage a consumer economy. A consumer economy then actually encourages the growth of other middle class, like class or middle class families and things like that, and the opening of more businesses and gives more people opportunities to actually leave the working class and move up, right? Costs are also gonna go down when it comes to like actually housing costs and or like uh, like utilities costs, whatever, like literally in the 1800s when utilitarianism becomes up, like actually grows on the rise. But another big thing about it though is you saw the rise of labor unions, okay? Labor organization, the first time it's gonna be seen since the guilds of the Middle Ages are going to pop up, right? Labor unions would actually organize themselves together and begin to fight for rights for the workers, right? Workers would use a lot of different strategies in these labor unions. They would go on strike, they would actually boycott certain goods, they would, do a, they would do walkouts and things like that. For any of y'all looking into the future, the late 1800s, labor unions became very active. If you've seen the new Enola Holmes 2 movie that talks about the matchstick girl strike and stuff like that, that walkout and that strike actually formed a massive labor union of matchstick girls who ended up fighting for their rights to get an area to eat their lunch away from the chemicals that they worked around and switching it to safer chemicals, uh, red phosphorus instead of white phosphorus, right? Now, negatives or massive negatives of the Industrial Revolution, though, also include wage stagnation, right? Which means that wages did increase for quite some time, but they're eventually going to plateau and they're just going to kind of go straight and they're actually not going to go much higher, right? Also, let's be honest with ourselves. 
children and people died or were injured or disfigured from working in these factories and things like that. Like, for example, this little boy right here who's missing several of his fingers and stuff like that, actually subject to a power loom probably ripping them off, right? And then also terrible working conditions whenever you're working in cities that are caked in smoke, caked in coal dust, and actually also trying to live and work in these areas, in these like non-ventilated factories is gonna be absolutely awful. And also the other big one though is pollution, right? Like as you can tell, pollution is gonna become a seriously huge issue. And literally they said that Victorian era London, which is in the 1800s, that Victoria era London was just a disgusting like area. Like there was just black, soot caked on to all these different things, that there was human waste in the Thames River causing cholera outbreaks and stuff like that. So the thing that, or not even stuff like that, cholera outbreaks. And there was one in 1858 called the Great Stink of 1858, right? So when we're looking at this, the pollution apparently actually even got so bad due to the Industrial Revolution that it affected the evolution of a certain insect, right? These things right here are called pepper moths, right? This is a natural pepper moth that's supposed to camouflage itself into a certain type of tree in London, right? Well, the thing about it is this is a black pepper moth. It's a mutated pepper moth that has too much of this black patterning. Thing about it is, it's easy. It, if in a natural situation, it was much easier for birds to see this black one, and so the black one would, would, would get eaten and their genes wouldn't pass on, and it was a simple form of evolution, right? Well, the problem was, is the birds actually started eating all these ones because the, the actual trees were so caked with coal dust that these guys ended up being the ones that actually blended in. So literally the pollution was so bad that it even affected those things, right? So the next thing that we're gonna be talking about though, especially when we get back into class and stuff like that, is we're now gonna be moving our discussion into what's going on in these different areas and stuff like that when Napoleon comes to power, right? So we're gonna be changing sections again and stuff like that. What we need to talk about now is what we've been talking about this whole time. We talked about Napoleon on the continent of Europe. We talked about what's going on in Great Britain while Napoleon's in power with the Industrial Revolution. And now what we're going to start picking up on is what is Napoleon going to do in terms of effect to places like North and South America, right? So if you actually look at this map right here, which is what it looked like when Napoleon came to power... <clears throat> Actually, no, it's not what it looked like when Napoleon came to power. Uh, so the big thing about it, because it still says, says British territory. So the thing about it, though, in general, is this is an older map of these two areas. It's about 1780, so this is about 19 years before Napoleon comes to power, right? So when we're looking at this entire thing, you got to understand that this area right here is nothing like the modern-day map of South America, right? The modern-day map of South and Central America has many different countries and many different areas and many different dialects and many different cultural heritage, like, based countries, okay? Well, that's mostly due to the fact that literally what is going down is that Napoleon's invasions in Europe are going to cause an outbreak and a growth of many new countries and many new groups of people. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but you already do know a little bit about this, right? Go ahead and jot all this stuff down. You already know a little bit about this from World Geo last year, right? When you had Mr. Wooderson and stuff like that, he talked about Don Pedro and the family of Portugal leaving and fleeing to Brazil when Napoleon was invading the continent of Europe. And then Don Pedro ended up staying and becoming Pedro I, right? We're going to talk about a similar situation to that, and we're going to talk about another Latin American independence movement because when Napoleon invaded like different areas of Europe, it caused so much confusion. Napoleon coupled with the French Revolution caused so much confusion that it actually allowed for new countries, new people, and new areas to collectivize themselves together and make a new pathway in history, right? So the big thing about it, though, is when we look at the background, though, the last time we were in South America, we were talking about the Maya, the Aztec, and the Inca, right? Right? We were talking about the natives that were taken over by the Spanish, particularly. And then also we talked a little bit about, as well, the British and their movements against the Native Americans and stuff like that. Well, European colonization is going to start right around the 1500s, right? That was way back in the day that we talked about Spain, Portugal, and France showing up, colonizing all these different areas. But a lot has happened since then, y'all. A lot has gone down since the 1500s, right? Including the <coughs> English Revolution AKA the Glorious Revolution of like F 1688 when William and Mary came and like actually ran the King of England off without shedding a drop of blood, which is going to help lead to the Enlightenment, right? Which helped lead to the American Revolution, which led to the French Revolution. And now what we're going to be talking about is Latin American independence and self determination in Europe, right? What we're now going to be getting into is how did Napoleon's efforts in Europe affect other areas of the globe, right? And we're particularly going to be zooming in on Latin America. Now, our first fo focus study is going to actually be on 
this area right here, okay? We're going to be talking about an area known as Saint-Domingue, which started out as originally as a French colony, right? But it's actually going to turn into the modern-day country of Haiti. But we'll pick up right there in class. I'll talk to you all soon. Y'all have a good one.